my colleagues, Father Festo McKenda and Bisrata Klilu, are talking today with two distinguished alumni of Tafet McConan School, Dr. Zeklilu Hapte and Mogus Gebremariam. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Good morning, good morning now, uh, Doug. Good morning. It's great to be with you. Now, many of you know Father Festo is writing a book that will come out fairly soon, A Splash of Diamond, that chronicles the history of the Jesuits in Ethiopia and devotes a full chapter, at least, to Tafen Mekonen School. And we all know Bisrata Klilu, the long-serving president of the Tuffet and McConan School Alumni Association of yeah. North America. Now, Bisrat, why don't we begin by your telling us a bit about our illustrious guests, Dr. Zeklilu and Mogus, and then we'll uh, pass the baton to Father Festo to kick off our discussion. Well, thank you very much, Doug. Uh, let me thank you for facilitating this uh, meeting. Uh, we are, of course, meeting on a, at a special time when we are all under lockdown in our respective house. Uh, so it's great to connect through modern technology, through Zoom. Uh, Father Festo, that is how I met him, through you. Uh, really, uh, what a great pleasure. Uh, for those of us who are uh, the very McConnell graduates and we've had long association with the Jesuits. Uh, the, this initiative that you've taken of uh, writing a book on the history of Jesuits in Ethiopia, which also in, invariably, you know, focuses partly on the very McConnell school where, where the Jesuits came to really teach at the invitation of the emperor. And of course, also led to the establishment of the university. It's something that uh, we're very, very proud and very happy to, uh, to, to get a different perspective from your book. So in that respect, uh, really great pleasure to have two extremely distinguished uh, al alumni of the Farimokon School, uh, Dr. Akilo Hapte and uh, Dr. Mogas Gebramariam with us, who will be interviewed by uh, Father Festo. Um, I really would not attempt to summarize their very rich uh, experience, you know, uh, so, but let me very briefly kind of mention uh, Dr. Akilu Hapte uh, has, of course, a special uh, place in Ethiopian history, especially in the history of Ethiopian education, uh, an academic scholar who later on became, of course, the president of Haile Selassie University. Uh, about which he recently had written a seminal book on uh, the history of uh, uh, Haile Selassie University. I'm sure you must have uh, seen it. Um, Dr. Akilu uh, was also a senior government official in Ethiopia, he was a minister. Um, uh, some subsequent to that, after that, uh, he had major leadership position in international, in international organizations such as the World Bank where he led the uh, uh, education department, the bank, and also of uh, UNICEF, the United Nations Children's Fund, uh, among others. But I think much more important than any of this involvement is really the, his commitment and his passion to, for Ethiopia and Ethiopian history and Ethiopian education and Ethiopian community since he has moved here. He plays a very, very active role in the Ethiopian community, uh, I mean, he's well, among the among those who has really worked very hard to to see change uh, that we are currently kind of uh, partly partly witnessing, and we hope that this will lead to a real real change in Ethiopia. So, really, it's a great great pleasure to have uh, Dr. Akil with us. Uh, at the same time, Dr. Morgas Gabramariam who also shares with Dr. Akilu, being a graduate of TMS and a graduate also of, of Haile Selassie University. I think Dr. Morgus graduated in 1965 from Tavim He got his MD from uh, medical uh, doctorate from Haile Selassie University. 
And uh, after moving to the United States, I mean, he's had, again, very, very illustrious uh, medical uh, practice, you know, where he's a uh, nephrology, nephrology specialist, uh, over 50 years of uh, practice uh, in the DC area. Again, similar to Dr. Akhugo, I think that what is very important is, again, his involvement in promoting education in, in Ethiopia, uh, promoting, of course, uh, uh, you know, fundamental change. And so I think he's been very, very heavily involved uh, in the political process, uh, you know, uh, while here as a diaspora trying to, to, to make change. So the two, I think it would be great. Um, no wonder that they have been interviewed by Doug in the Entwine Lives, uh, you know, in Doug's Corner, as we call it, uh, in, in the Tavarim School Alone Association website. So uh, look forward to hear uh, their stories uh, uh, as uh, Father Festo uh, interviews them. So let me turn it over to you, Father Festo. Thank you very much. Uh, greatly appreciate. Uh, uh, being here with you. Um, it's a great honor for me. Um, as you know, um, and as it has been said, I'm working on a small book, A Splash of Diamond, in honor of the Canadian Jesuits who came to Ethiopia in 1945 at the invitation of the emperor uh, to help in the education system in Ethiopia. And as I work on this publication, I've been reading a lot what is published, what has been written and in, in the archives. And I've come across uh, your names and having this opportunity to meet you in person is really important for me and for, for the book that I'm writing because I feel meeting you in person gives uh, a, a special kind of light to the story that I am writing. Um, as you know, the Jesuits came to Ethiopia at the invitation of the emperor. And I realized that uh, as we celebrate 75 years since, since the Canadians went to Ethiopia, uh, one way of honoring them and of remembering them really would be uh, publishing something in their honor. And this is what I'm trying to do. Uh, the book that I'm preparing will be uh, not a big book, uh, not too much text, but a simple story that many people will be able to read, uh, accompanied by, by, by many photos, many pictures, many illustrations of former students uh, at the Parimakonen School, as well as at the University College of Addis Ababa. And I'm really, I'm really excited that I'll be able to include some of, of your photos as well, and uh, not only uh, during your time at uh, Tapari Makonen and uh, University College Addis Ababa, but also about your life after the experience of being taught by the Jesuits and also working with some of the Jesuits. So let me begin by uh, a very simple uh, question to both of you. As you know, uh, Tafari Makonen School was really a pre prestigious school in Ethiopia at that time in the 50s and 60s. And my interest is to know how you got into Tafari Makonen uh, School. Uh, uh, what was your family background and how did that eventually work out that you found yourself in this prestigious school in Addis Ababa? And let us begin with Dr. Aklilu. Thank you very much, Father. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to meet you. Thank um, you. After, I am, after all, the product of the Jesuits in some ways. Um, my education began, as you said, at Tafari Makon School, uh, who chose the not only a very prestigious but a historic school. It was built by the emperors when he was a regent. It was built with his own money. The government at that time, we did not have a government school at that time, so he started a school, the first school being Menelik. Uh, 
he also encouraged other people to follow his suit. So he led by example. He led by example. And I was, uh, my parents came from Bishoftu to Addis Ababa uh, because my dad got a job in the government, the Ministry of uh, Commerce. Uh, there was a neighbor who was a student of Tafari Makon School, and he found out that I was not a student of Tafari Makon School, so he said, where are you going to school? And so I said to my neighbor's school at that time, which is now the lycée. It was not a lycée at that time, a French school. It was uh, just a government school. It was the beginning of, of uh, education really after the destruction of Ethiopia by the, by the Italians. And so he said, join Tafari Makon School. He said, that's the best school. And they have so many things that you will enjoy. He excited me. I didn't tell my parents. So the next day in the morning, we went together straight to Tafari Makon School. But on the way, we stopped in the Minister of Education. And they asked us why we were there. He said to join, I want to join Tafari Makon School, like my friend said, can you read? Yes. He gave me a test. I passed the test and I joined the school. He gave me so I joined the very much. And, and the, since then, I spent most of my, well, almost all of my education career, my high school completely in the school. And uh, here I am. Maybe Mogus can say more about, yeah. Thank you, Doc Dr. Mogus. Yes, can, can you hear me? Yes. Good. Uh, first of all, I'm really proud to sit in the same panel with Dr. Akrilu, who was my dean at the University of Maryland. When I received my medical degree, he was the one who presented me to the emperor. That was in 1972. I'm also glad to be with Dagidi, who was my teacher, and also Besrat with my esteemed colleague. My, my story in life is a little bit different. Uh, my father was a deacon in, in Toto Raguel Church before the war. After the war, when he got married and had, my, and had me, his dream was to present me to his teacher as a deacon of, an Ethiopian church, of the Ethiopian church. My father was blessed with a very good voice and he was a celebrated church singer, church digger. Unfortunately, I was cursed with a very bad voice. So at the age of six, he tried to teach me the church songs, like Dase, but whatever came out of my mouth just disgusted him so much that after a few time attempt of about four years, uh, of about, uh, I don't know, one, six months or so, he gave up on me. He said, listen, you are so cursed with a bad voice that I dare not approach my teacher, Yenita Fork, and present you as my son. So, I'm, so you have to spend the rest of your life with a foreign education, with a foreign education. So he took me to Tafari Makun School, and I was gladly accepted at Tafari Makun School. But at that time, the Jesuits in Ethiopia were not allowed to wear religious scarves, their skirts. Mm. Because of the long history in Ethiopia of 1630, where Father Alphonse Mendez tried to convert Ethiopia to Catholicism. Mm. The result was a massacre of so many Ethiopians that from that day on, the word Catholic became almost as bad as Islam. So when the emperor started the Vermont school, one of the conditions was that the priests, the Jesuit priests, were not allowed to wear their, their robes and they were not allowed to convert us to Catholicism. Ever since that time, and when my father, when I get closer and closer to the teachers, to my teachers, like Father Baudry and Father Turin and Father Rodrigue, 
my father would always remember, remind me, listen son, God may have rewarded the white man with the materials of this earth. But remember that we, Ethiopian Orthodox followers, are the only ones who will inherit the kingdom of God in heaven. So that was what kept me from being Catholic. Otherwise, with all the dedication, the love, the faith, and all the care that they showed to us, I could have become and should have become a Catholic and a Jesuit. That is my story from the very beginning. I'll give you the rest later on. Thank you. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to ask uh, another general question. Um, again, my interest is, is to know how you interacted with the Jesuits at Tafari Makonen and, and, and what you feel would be the impact of the way Jesuits taught, the way Jesuits administered the school. How did this impact your life? as a person, your academic life, and your future life as a human being. Um, how do you look back at that experience of being taught and, uh, and, and relating with the Jesuits uh, in, your life, in your young lives? Now, this time we can begin with uh, Dr. Morges. You want? Okay. Well, uh, at the age of eight, when I was introduced to Tafari Makul School, the first thing is everything impacts you. The TMS and the Jesuits, you know, they impact you or they impact the, very, the minute you walk into the school. Everything in Tafari at that time was meticulously clean, organized, structured, and order, orderly. The buildings, the lanes, the playing fields, even the roofs were painted. The garden was clean, I remember. The roses were beautiful. There was a guy who was beautiful, and the rooms, the desks, the library. And then after that, you begin to experience the day-to-day -day life. The day-to-day -day life was also organized very, very meticulously and was kept religiously. That, uh, because there was time to get up, there was time to eat, there was time to get in line, time to salute the flag, then time to march into class. Then you had the first period, second period, 40 minutes each, and then there was a break of 20 minutes each, then the third period and the fourth period start, then the lunch break, then you come back after lunch, fifth and sixth grade, and then when everybody goes to school, whatever the famous students will spend one hour called study period or study period, which one hour to, to, to do your homework, to review what you learned, and this was meticulously always supervised by Mr. Gagno and his students. So, and not only the time, but also the semesters, at that time we used to call them terms. They were three terms in the school year, first, second, and third. It ended with a ceremony going to the auditorium to hear our results. Our standings were read, winners were awarded, with certificates for each subject and also for general, for, for, class, for general class standards. The year was also completed and organized the same way. We'll go to the auditorium, we'll hear from the director who was first in class, who was last in class, who first, who won this award, who won that award. So that's why in the end, you come upon this idea or this impression that hard work, discipline, discipline, and discipline was the way of life. And these things impacted me a long, long time after I, after I left Safari uh, Bokun. I think these characters were a reflection of the Jesuit training they had themselves. It was the Jesuit way of life, you know. Little did we know later on that all this became, all this was the result of the Jesuit education. These young Jesuits at that time were about in their 20s and 30s. Mm -hmm. Little did realize how far they came from home, from Canada, thousands of miles away, where they could have lived a wonderful life. They chose to come to Ethiopia from a young age, spend all their time to Ethiopia, dedicate all their life to Ethiopia, all for our betterment. I mean, there's no other example of dedication, love, faith, and hope 
than what the Catholics or the Jesuits of the French Canadians did to our country. Uh, uh, <clears throat> and so their commitment to us was total and absolute. It was not limited only to academics. Maybe later on, I'll come, if you want me, I'll continue, but no, later on, I'll come to you. Uh, in their spare time, each Jesuit volunteered in a specific subject to shape us and to help us. Mm -hmm. Good example, Father Marcel Garo, mm -hmm. was a history teacher, but he established our bank TMS, Bank of TMS. It was a small savings and loan program for the students. Mm -hmm. In our poverty at that time, we thought that was as big as Bank America, but it was wonderful what it did to us. <laughs> Father Payer established what we call the Radio TMS. Which was, we enjoyed it as much as we enjoyed Radio, Radio Ethiopia or BBC. Uh, Father Gagnon, we'll go later on to it. Father Gagnon, other than being the great disciplinarian, other than being taking care of the day-to-day -day activities of TMS, he also built what we call our Great Wall of TMS. He defined the perimeter of TMS. Before that, TMS was, the campus was just like as a crossroad where everybody would walk in and walk out. Uh, if it was at this time, I would call it, it was our southern wall of Trump. <laughs> <laughs> to keep the aliens away from our, from TMS. He defined TMS, the perimeters of TMS. Mm -hmm. uh, but later on, I think maybe I'll give time to, to, to Dr. Akilo this time. Then I'll go to two Jesuits who <laughs> shaped my life. Let me okay. refer to Dr. Akilo. Now. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Akilu, um, the very same question, but um, uh, let me probably uh, uh, emphasize um, as, as you continue uh, what uh, Dr. Moges just said. Uh, you can add anything that you want, but how has such personal experiences of the Jesuits actually impacted your career beyond Tafari Makonen School. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, actually, I was one of the lucky ones since when I finished Tafari Makonen School mm. and took a matriculation for a college. Mm -hmm. The first college, that's a university college, mm -hmm. The headmaster there, the, or the dean, was also the head of the Farimakon School, Mr. Lucien Matt. Mm -hmm. um, so it so happened that I was, I knew beforehand at least one or two of the teachers that were at the university college. Mm -hmm. The, you know, the period of the Jesuits when I joined. It was, it was also a very fermentation age mm -hmm. period of education, of modern education in Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. And the emperor himself believes very strongly in, in a disciplined education. Mm -hmm. The Jesuits are very disciplined people. <laughs> and their life is disciplined, no question. Mm -hmm. um, and when I left, all oh, this has to impact you in some way. Mm. Uh, whether that is for the better or for the worse, for me it's for the better. I think it's formed me who I am. Mm. It, 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 when, when I left the Tafari Makon School and joined the university college and graduated from the university college, then they sent me further for, to foreign country, to Canada actually, and that's where I continued my uh, 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 graduate level education mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in the University of Manitoba in Canada. The Canadian Jesuits are, um, well, the, the Jesuits that, uh, that I am familiar with yes. are very disciplined people. Mm -hmm. They're organized, as the Dr. Moga said, and the school is 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 a, a symbol of discipline mm -hmm. whatever you just you just cannot behave the way you want to behave mm -hmm. uh, especially when it comes to doing homeworks mm -hmm. especially when 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 it it comes to 
you know, to uh, interact with, with your colleagues, you have to be polite, you have to be loving, and, and I think this has been very, very welcome as far as I'm concerned, and, and I'm so grateful for their contribution and for their education. That almost like my father, some of the, my, my class teacher is the first four Canadians Jesuits that came to Ethiopia. One of them was uh, Mr. Louis Philippe Prevo. Mm -hmm. um, and Mr. Lucien Matt, of course, was the head, and Mr. Bela, and Mr. Zipfel. Mr. Zipfel was a disciplinarian. Mm -hmm. I mean, you better behave, otherwise you just give your hand and you get your five flaps <laughs> in your hand and, and, and go straight to, to the classroom. Um, I, I, I just want to say, I am I'm, I'm grateful for the education I got from them yeah. um, and, and I think part of me is part of who they were at that time in, 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 in the way they formed me in education. Mm -hmm. Do you feel, this is just a follow up on, on, uh, on the, the order, the discipline that was at Tafari Makon and at that time and yeah. An obvious question for someone from another age is: uh, Did you feel at that time that there was enough socializing for students, enough time to play, enough time to just be young boys and girls in the school, or was everything so strict and about the academic? Yeah. yeah. No. Uh, Tafari Taf Makon School was a boys' school. Mm -hmm. It was an all boys school. One thing about the Jesuits, mm. it's not only the academic life, but it's also the sports activities. Mm. They, they really provide, you know, different kinds of sports facilities, which many schools were not privileged. Mm. They provided it. They, they, they find a way, for instance, Tavari McConnell School had four football fields. Uh -huh. And, and small ones and, and the medium ones and the, the larger ones and the, where the students, if they want to play, they play. If they want to run, they run. Uh -huh. uh, and so, uh, yes, uh, academic life is important. You have to behave, you have to, to be well, to do well in education. But in addition, they, they provided you with sports activities, very much so. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I'm going to uh, switch on to another question now and probably ask something more personal um, that you might be able to remember uh, uh, from your experience in school and I'm going to begin with uh, Dr. Moges. Um, any kind of interaction, direct interaction with any of the Jesuits at Tafari Marcon and that has remained with you, that you look back to and say, wow, uh, there was that moment with this Jesuit or that Jesuit. Any, any such memorable time or event? Yes, uh, and I'll mention two of them. The first one was uh, uh, Father Paul Baudry. Father Paul Baudry was the leader of the Boy Scouts uh, in TMS. He was later on assisted by Father Noel Rodrigue. Uh, Father Paul Baudry was a very, very kind, fatherly figure. Um, other than his academic responsibilities, he took time to organize the Boy Scouts of, uh, of TMS. That's where, he, uh, that's where he was at his best. He spent countless hours you know, coaching us, guiding us, uh, teaching us about life. He would take us to hikes, he would take us to journeys, he would take us, he would show us the whole of Ethiopia. He showed me Langano as Boy Scouts. We went to Lake Langano, Lake Awasa, Managesha, even Arba Minch, Lake Abaya, and so on. He took us and showed us the whole of Ethiopia. Every time we used to go there, and in the evenings we used, before campfire, he used to take us individually and in groups, and he would lecture to us about life, about love, about sense of duty, about civics, and about everything to make us good human beings. 
And that was his mission in life was to shape us individually and in groups. And that we will never, never, never forget, all of us. Mm -hmm. Even when we grow, it was a privilege to be a Boy Scout member in, in TMS because of Father Baudry. There's no question about it. His impact for us was seminous. And uh, when he died, he died of cerebral malaria in Ethiopia. He specifically asked to be buried in Ethiopia. And I was at his funeral at what we call Peter Paul Hospital, Peter Paul Church in Ethiopia, in Addis Ababa. Father Baudry remains an important, important figure in everybody's life. I loved him and he loved me so much that he used to give me small homeworks, small jobs, and I used to do it. And uh, as I told you before, he loved me so much that he, he really, really wanted me to be a Catholic priest. But then I remember what my father told me. So one day he told me, Mogus, you're such a good man. You're gonna be a good Christian, or I mean a good Catholic. I know he's dropping hints. Then my father was also <laughs> came to me and said, Yes, I remain a good Christian, a good Orthodox. We laughed at each other. Uh, I mean, we laughed at each other, and I still remember that occasion. But Father Baudry remains close to my heart. I still love him like an alternate father. I will never, never, never forget Father Paul Baudry. Next to him is uh, the other Jesuit. Fortunately, he's still alive. Is Father Roland Turain. He lives in a nursing home in Richelieu, in Montreal. Uh, uh, Father Turin and I met, uh, I think, remember closely in 1960. Before that, we didn't get close. He gave me a job at a summer, uh, a summer job as the, to record the amount of rainfall during the rainy season, season. There was a small meteorological station near their house. So diligently, for whole two months, I came from my house, measured the amount of rainfall, recorded it, went back. He was so impressed that at the end of the rainy season, he gave me some money, little amount of money, then he gave me a beautiful flaming red jacket, <laughs> which I wore. But this flaming red jacket, or, you know, it attracted the bullies from a mile away. And it was a sharp contrast with my shabby pants, which is wonderful. So everybody, all the bullies used to come punch me, kick me, tease me, slap me. So as much as I love Father Turin, I still remember him with all those things. Later on, I became so good in geography, which is what he was teaching, that I wanted to be a geographer. In my high school examination, matriculation, I got a B. Father Turin was so mad, he took my paper and gave it to Professor Masum Waldemariam, who was the head of the geography department, and also an alumni of Dr. McConnell. He was a contemporary to Dr. To Dr. Aklilo. He, he just shouted on Professor Maslund, if he can't give A to Mogus, who are you gonna give A to? <laughs> I mean, he was so mad. That, uh, uh, and Dr. Professor Maslund is still alive in Adsawa, he still remembers it. So I hope you'll, you'll also interview him. In spite of that, uh, I mean, in addition to that, Father Train organized the book binding program of Safari Moku School. And we used to bind worn books to make them life, to make them last for as much as, much as possible. It became very profitable. The Ministry of Education also ordered other schools to bring their books to TMS in order to preserve them with book binding. It made a lot of money for him. And he made from the money from there, he gave it to Safari Moku School for the geography department. So, Father Turin spent 61 years in Ethiopia, mm. 61 years. After 976, he went to Bishoftu and then he became a chaplain in, in Woliso Hospital. Mm. After that, he was literally dragged out of Ethiopia at the age of 92 to go back to Montreal. Busrat and I went to visit him about a year ago. Since Busrat was the president of TMS at Tafari Mokun School Alumni, he donated $2,000 to Father Train just for expense. Father Train took every single cent of that $2,000 and donated back to the Ethiopian family in Addis Ababa where he helps. That's how much dedication goes. Even at the age of 93, his heart is still in Ethiopia. 
is still working, is still helping, is still is experiencing his what we call agape. Like St. Paul said, of all the three attributes, faith, love, and hope. Hope is the love is the best. Father Twain is still experiencing that. So he still remains very, very close to my heart. Roland Twain, 96 years old, still alive and kicking in Montreal, Canada. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I must add that it was very difficult for us to let him go as well. We really wanted to keep him in Addis Ababa or somewhere in East Africa for as long as we could. But I think he needed more specialized care and yes. we, had, we just had to accept it. Um, I'm going to turn to Dr. Aklilu and, and here if you have any memorable experiences as well, uh, direct uh, interactions with, yeah. with the Jesuits. Well, I mean, you know, your teachers, my experience is the, with the four Canadian Jesuits that came. Uh -huh. um, and the one that was our class teacher was Mr. Louis Philippe Prevost. Mm -hmm. It's a Mr. Prevost, he was a class teacher. And once he's a class teacher, he's, he's also your mentor everywhere. I mean, yes. Wherever, whatever you do, whatever you need, you go and you tell him, and you can go straight to his room, knock to his room, mm -hmm. and talk to him. Uh, I mean, this was real. This were really good, good, good people. Uh, mm. Now that when I think of it, as you are celebrating the 75, 75th year, mm. and when I think of it, mm. I remember what was going on early on in life. Mm. I mean, this of course they they're dedicated to priesthood, mm. but more than that, their interaction with a foreign country, with the foreign people. Mm -hmm. uh, foreign language, it's a language the, we have English is not our language that to teach us mm -hmm. and they were just completely dedicated to us and now I, I realize why the emperor selected the Canadian Jesuits to come to Ethiopia and, and he was absolutely right. <laughs> Very happy to hear that. Um, yeah. And uh, let me, uh, again, a follow-up question on that. Uh, I'm sure uh, you would have worked at the University College of Haile Selassie, the first university, with Claude Sumner. Claude uh, Sumner, yes, a philosopher. Yes. I mean, yes. how do you look at Sumner's contribution to the study of Ethiopia and, and, and his work well, at, the, at the university? Well, look, Claude is, is a quiet kind of a person. Uh -huh. In general, he's uh, he, he's made a tremendous contribution himself. Claude yeah. is 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 also. I mean, of all the Jesuits, I frankly do not remember any one person mm -hmm. that I can single out to say he has not made a contribution. They've, uh -huh. they've all made contributions in different ways. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, and 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 I'm I, I feel so happy and so proud that I'm their student now. Great, I'm very happy to hear yeah. that. Yeah. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, and then, plus, may I add something? Oh. Yes, please, yeah. Go ahead, Mr. Rath. No, uh, I was going to say just to Father Festo, there is, a, there is a story that was told by one of the alumnus, uh, you know, at Hotel La Teshoma, and actually we have it on the website where he talks about the emperor coming to visit the students while they were having the boarding students while they were having dinner and uh, he looked around of course Stafari McConnell you know attracted you know students of all social background from the very modest people from modest means to people who come from very rich families from people who were you know even relatives of the emperor you know, from the royal family, so it was just a whole range. So obviously there were a bit of a different treatment for some as far as, you know, the way they were housed and so on. So apparently the emperor came in, looked around, and he could not see any of the students from the royal family. And then he said, where are they? Where, where? 
And then somebody said, no, 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 they, have, they are eating in a separate place because the food is coming from the palace for them. And he said, from today onwards, not even a single thing would ever, ever be supplied to school for any student. Everybody has to eat here together. So he said he stopped it and everybody started eating. Now, just thinking of that, yeah. I think one of the attributes of the Jesuits is also really treating uh, students, irrespective of who you are, from what kind of family you come, equally. Mm. If you're not good, they will kick you out. It doesn't matter who it is. But there are stories that we know of some who are asked to leave, including the grandchildren of the emperor, wow. whom he asked, you know. So I just w was wondering if either Dr. Akilu or Dr. Bogus have stories that they know of about the equalizing influence of the Jesuits when it comes to treating students, irrespective of social status. I mean, that's how we, we always say it. When it comes to Jesuits, it doesn't matter who you are. They will treat you the same. So I just wonder if you have any stories of that. Let Dr. Akriru begin. I'm sure he has a lot of stories with Zifer and so on. Dr. Akriru. Yeah, well, definitely when, you know, when I went to school, I was not a boarder. I was not, I was a day student. I was, and I was yet in the highest class, in the, in the top class. And the judges just could not realize that I could not be boarding. So they made the decision that from the next week on, get permission from your parents and you have a place here in boarding. Uh -huh. So they, they, they made me a boarder, a student in, in the school. And in the school, Tavari Makon School, the boarding schools in the earlier period, were, as Dr. Mogus tried to say, different levels. There were certain classrooms where 20, 30 students sleep in the same room with different beds, you know. So this one, we call them 30 shilling, 30 shilling board uh, rooms. <laughs> because at that time there was, we were using also the English shilling. There were others that were paid 50 shillings. These were more senior ones. Mm -hmm. And there are the other one, very few ones, where you pay 80 shillings. And the emperor and the, the Jesuits, when the emperor came to inspect the school, he said, whose room is this? He found out that the ones with the 80 shillings were, you know, the uh, students from the emperor's royal family, yeah, the top, the top, the top class of the of the society, mm -hmm. and you know he said it should be by educational level. Mm -hmm. So the top class, that's the top class. So he took us from the thirty shilling into the eighty shilling, <laughs> which, which is the top class, and and from then on. Equalization in practice mm -hmm. is, has had, had to proceed. Amazing, amazing. Well, said, maybe we have some examples. Yes, I do. <laughs> uh, I, I wanted Dr. Akhil to go first because he, he knows earlier students. Uh, during the feudal period of Ethiopia, Haile Selassie wanted to instill modern education. He especially wanted the feudal lords to have their children educated. Most of them send their kids reluctantly. The giant master of the government, Selassie, who was the grandson of Emperor Johannes, told me that he came to Tafari Mokonen <laughs> as a boarding student with two servants <laughs> to take care of him and one meal. <laughs> so you can imagine that the school has to, has, to, has to accommodate not only the students, the priest student, but also the two servants that had come with him. So Zifel, finally had to equalize everything and after that there was no distinction between poor people and, uh, and rich people. There was an acute awareness of poor people because most of us did not have good clothing. We had one clothing for the year <laughs> and 
by the by by the middle of the year everything was torn into rags we didn't have another clothes so i think that was the impetus to have a school uniform but the, the jesuits wanted or they did everything they could to equalize us in my year in the seventh grade in 1960 1959 the grandson of the emperor uh paul mcconnell the son of Ras Ababa, and also Michael uh, Mangesha, we, we attend the school. And Paul was, of course, Paul, he was the grandson of the favorite son of the emperor, he was still the emperor, and he wanted to play, you know, uh, a prince. Unfortunately, neither Ganyo, nor Prevo, nor our esteemed teacher, Atok Zain Tokor, would allow that. So he got his, uh, what do you call that, mass uh, marathon, he got his uh, beating, just like all of us got our beating. Physical beating in TMS was accepted. We even employed one full-time person whose job was to administer beating. That's his full-time job. <laughs> so we would be sent to the school, to, 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 the, head, to, to the office of the, headmaster, of the headmaster with three penalties four penalties, and then you used to get five beatings on hand. That was normal. It was not abuse, but that was discipline. And the Canadians did everything they could to, to equalize all of us. And that was a, a big uh, achievement. I wanted to mention one thing about Claude Sumner, which is very important for Ethiopia. I'm sure Dr. Akhil knows that. Claude Sumner was a philosopher. Mm. And he did a wonderful job of translating the work of one Ethiopian philosopher called Zarayakob. It's called Hatata Zarayakob, which is very important to us because, uh, <clears throat> I'm sure Doug Edi is listening here, <laughs> the white people will tell us that black people don't have their own indigenous philosopher. They say that we don't have, they don't have any philosophy. In Ethiopia, we are proud to have four indigenous philosophers. One is Saint Yared, the other one is Christo Samra. And the third one is Zarayakov. Zarayakov was an indigenous Ethiopian Christian who wrote his feelings, his association with God and his faith and so on. This was so important that many, many, uh, many foreigners or many universities read it and say that this cannot come from an African mind. So this Zarayakob must be a pseudonym for a Portuguese Jesuit priest who was hiding in Ethiopia and he wrote it in a pen name. We still get offended by that because some white people cannot accept the fact that black people can have their own indigenous philosophy. And I'm grateful for Klaus Sumner to translate that and present it to the rest of the world. And I met Klaus Sumner many times in Lake, uh, Lake Langano, Lake Awasa, when Father Bode would bring him for summer camp. He would swim, with a very good swimmer, and then he would sit down and talk to us in his baritone voice with a very, very impressive teacher. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, our, our time has really moved, but I have one last quick question that I don't want to leave unasked. Um, and you've already mentioned uh, the emperor quite a lot, and there's no way anybody can tell the story of the Jesuits in Ethiopia and the Canadian Jesuits especially, really without coming to terms with the emperor's own interest in education and in modern education. One Jesuit tells the story that the emperor told him that even if by educating the young, it will cost him his empire, then so be it. And uh, I mean, such love for education, uh, I, I think it, it's, it's amazing. And I just want to hear uh, very quickly your word on uh, what you think uh, Ayla Selassie's contribution to Ethiopian education has been. Dr. Oh, oh my goodness. I mean, modern education really is Haile Selassie. Mm -hmm. yeah, you know, when in, in uh, the beginning 
of modern education in Ethiopia, I said, started with Minilik, the first school. Mm -hmm. But the establishment of a school system, mm -hmm. the development of the curriculum, indigenous curriculum, in the development of, of uh, Ethiopian language, Amharic, mm -hmm. the distribution of schools throughout. Mm -hmm. I mean, this really is a contribution of Emperor Hilsilasi. Mm -hmm. I mean, when he started, sometimes you cannot start schools all over at the same time because there are no teachers, mm -hmm. there are no books. Mm -hmm. uh, and when you start one place, the emperor made sure that opportunity is distributed. So he brings the students from those places where there are these schools do, did not exist. Mm. And, and, and this is a typical way of the emperor's philosophy in terms of distributing educational opportunity to different people. When the opportunity is there and the level is not there, he made sure that people come to share, to partake of this opportunity. This is in, in, in teacher training. When the so-called, the first teacher training was started in Addis Ababa, you cannot bring teacher training, you know, from the different provinces at the same time. So when the school was open, he made sure that, he made sure that students that meet the level to come to, to the teacher training school, he brought them from the different parts of the country. Mm -hmm. and, and, and this is the emperor's, his own philosophy, of making sure that this opportunity is distributed among his people as much as possible. That, that I have seen in practice being done mm. when, when, when he was doing it. Thank you. Uh, uh, Dr. Mogas, you have yes. something to add on that? Yes, please. Uh, the emperor was fully aware of the dilemma that modern education brings to the survival of our traditional values in Ethiopia. Does modern education mean repeal of Ethiopian values? Those with modern education, are they gonna be faithful to our religion, to our country, or are, or are they all going to convert into Catholicism uh, or, and, and to Ethiopian values? He was aware of that and he did everything he could in his power to balance modernization with Ethiopian values and Ethiopian customs. He was warned many, many times by the traditional nobles to stay away from modernization of Ethiopia. The famous one was a guy called Raskasa, who was a traditional chief, but educated churchman with very good conservative values. He was acutely aware that modern education was going to dethrone Haile Selassie. And he told him specifically, you train, you bring up these poor people into, you bring them to power and mark my words, they will overthrow you. And that happened eventually. So Haile Selassie was aware of that, but he was convinced that there's no other way to keep the survival of Ethiopia without modernizing it. And he did it at the peril of his own personal life. And that's how history is going to remember him. Greatness surpasses personal interest, national value, national interest prevail. He did it and we will always, always remember him as the greatest Ethiopian monarch for a long time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I think uh, we'll, try and conclude this now, but let me say this. Um, I'm a Tanzanian and a historian. Um, I'll be teaching African history here at Xavier University in Cincinnati. And uh, as a historian, we always struggle uh, to find resources and, and stories that tell a story of African initiative. And I must say that it's refreshing uh, to study the history of Ethiopia. 
because it's so obvious that here is documented African initiative. And I, I feel very proud about this. And even as I work on this uh, uh, history of the Jesuits in Ethiopia, I know uh, that I'm telling a story of an African initiative. And it's a story that I hope will go beyond Ethiopia so that other African countries, uh, other African young men and women, other African people, especially in our region in East Africa, can be familiar with this, can know what was happening in Ethiopia uh, in, in the 40s and 50s and 60s when the rest of, of the countries were really struggling to get rid of, of, of colonial rule and all that. It is a story that needs to be known in the region and probably even taught in our schools in the region. So I'm very grateful uh, for your facilitation, for your personal stories, for being a part of this broader story that I believe we all need to know, not only in Ethiopia, but, but well beyond Ethiopia. Thank you very much. I think I'll pass the baton to Pistrat uh, Aklilu and then uh, back to uh, Doug to conclude. Thank you. Well, the Father Festo, I think you, say, you said it, you summarized it extremely well. So I really not much uh, that I can add, but uh, I mean, the, the history of Sartre Mokon, the history of modern education, I think uh, really requires more writings, you know, and uh, I'm glad that you're going to add to that. Uh, and uh, we look forward for the completion of this book and for also this lockdown, uh, hopefully, to be over so that we'll have our, uh, we are supposed to have our biannual meeting of the, the Frame of Conan Alumni Association North America uh, during the Memorial Weekend, which, which has now been postponed. And if we, when we have it, hopefully in the next few months when it opens up, I uh, would certainly would like to invite you uh, to that, uh, that meeting to, to give a presentation about your book and meet uh, more uh, PMS uh, alumni. And uh, thank you very, very much for this initiative. And again, thank you, Dr. Akilu, Dr. Mogas. And uh, uh, so let me turn it over to, to Doug. Well, I think it's been said. By the way, um, when Father Festo does speak, it would be a great book signing opportunity. Can we expect the book signing? in three or four months? Um, it is possible uh, <laughs> to require extra, extra work. Um, but well, it, then get to work. <laughs> We're looking forward to it. <laughs> I want to join Bisrat and Father Festo in thanking you, Dr. Akhilu and Dr. Mogus, for spending your precious time with us today. Sorry, we had a little technical glitch, but um, uh, th this, uh, I think, is a very impressive uh, program, and I'm privileged to have been part of it. I want to thank you for taking the time and effort to make uh, this contribution. So, with no further ado, shall Great. we say goodbye? Tanasteling. I wish you all well. Tanasteling. Yeah. Father, wish you luck. Thank you so much. Thank wish you. you luck, Father. Uh, just a reminder that just like Bussard brought about this pandemic, there's a picture of the emperor during the last pandemic in 1918. Oh. Uh, so maybe we'll be able to in his book. I think you should do that. And also, I strongly recommend that uh, Dr. Akilu send you his book about higher education Ethiopia, which contains all the very Mokon and the University of Blo uh, the University of Maryland, the University, Harris University, and all the Jesuits. Dr. Akililu. Thank you. All right. Uh, uh, give me the send me the address, Busra, to you. I will. Okay. I will. But it is in America, unfortunately. I would love to have it. <laughs> yeah, I would right. love to have it. Yes, yeah, thank yeah. you. I'll send you a copy. Thank you so much. I appreciate yeah. it. I, I will so do that. so we hope you're getting back to work this afternoon. Absolutely. <laughs> On the book. Right from here. I'm not switching my computer off. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> yeah. Also, if you need pictures, I have pictures. I'm sure Bisrat will. I'll give it to Bisrat, or I'll send it to you if you need any pictures. Thank, yes, I need a lot of pictures. Yes, thank you, thank you, okay. thank Great. you very much. Bye bye. Well, thank, thank you, you again, and um, maybe we'll have another opportunity soon. Yes, thank you, Doug. Thank or you, another Doug. Thank you. Thank you, thank good you after, so much. Yeah. Good afternoon. Good, good afternoon. Okay. Be safe. Bye bye, Be safe, everyone. Bye. Goodbye. Bye bye.